a rabbi who his friend, the priest, calls him over and says, listen, I need to go out of town for two weeks. So I need to t- you to take over for me my Sunday mess. The confession booth. So I have someone to speak, but I don't have someone to do the confessions. You know, nobody knows what's right, what's wrong. You're my good friend. Maybe you could sit inside the booth and just take the confessions for me. The rabbi says, listen, with all due respect, I don't know how to do a confession. I don't know how to take a confession. What do I do? What do I say? So... The, rabbi, the, the priest says, come, come with me. You'll hide. Nobody can see inside of this booth anyways. Come, sit inside with me. You'll listen to what I do, and you'll learn. <clears throat> so the rabbi comes inside. The person comes to the window and says, Father, I've sinned. He said, what did you sin? He said, me. He said, I stole from somebody. He said, how many times? He said, I stole from them three times. He said, how much? He said, a certain amount. He said, okay. You've got to give twenty-five dollars, three Hail Marys, and you'll be atoned. Okay, the guy walks away. Next, the guy comes. It says, "Father, I've sinned." He said, "What did you sin?" He said, "I killed someone." He said, "Killed someone?" He said, "Yeah, how many times? I killed three different people." He said, "Why?" He said, "I'm part of the mafia." So I said, "Okay, twenty-five dollars, three Hail Marys, you'll be atoned." And this goes on the whole day like that. Finally, the priest turns to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, you got it? He says, this, this is simple. He said, I thought it's something complicated. Some Talmudic thing. He said, okay, don't worry. I'll take over for two weeks. The next week, the rabbi is sitting in the booth. Somebody comes in. He says, Father, I have sinned. He said, my son, what did you do? He said, I robbed some banks. He said, how many? He said, two banks. He said, oh, too bad. He said, we're doing a three-for-one special now. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to vidui, to tshuva, a lot of the words we're using, confessions, atonement, we're using words that we're borrowing from other cultures and we're not really sure what they mean. The word teshuva doesn't mean repent. I don't know what the word repent means. The word tshuva means to return back to HaKadosh Baruch to come back to who you're supposed to be. It could be that the closest word to that in English is repent, but the word repent, I'll tell you what, the first time I saw that word was when I was in Times Square as a yeshiva boy, and there was a lady holding a big sign, and it said, repent for the end is near, that's what it said on the sign. And she's screaming at the repent for the end is near, for the whole day she was screaming in Times Square. And I was thinking about it, one crazy Jew made the whole world walk around with signs, repent the end is near. Do you know how much power you have? <clears throat> how much strength one human being has? You have to think about it. You have one person that a billion people in the world follow. A guy who for us, he was an illegitimate child. He was a nobody. He came from a broken home. And look, look what, look who he became. You have a lot of potential. You're much better. So what are the parts of tshuva? What do I have to do that are... What are we've been talking tshuva, tshuva, we have to do tshuva. We have to come close to HaKadosh Baruch How do I practically do it? Sparing you the details, I want to give you the four steps of tshuva. As the Rambam tells us in the laws of tshuva. And you should know there are other rabbis who argue. What are the steps? What order are they going? We have to have one rule. Maran, Rabbi Yosef Kao, does not talk about tshuva. It's not in his Shulchan Aruch, laws of tshuva. And uh, Maran generally dealt with different kinds of halachot. And the Rambam starts off his book with, you must believe in Hashem and there's one creator. Maran doesn't start off his halacha like that. Maran starts off with how you wake up in the morning. So the question is, does Maran believe you don't have to believe in Hashem? I mean, if, if you're reading Shulchan Aruch, the assumption is you believe in Hashem. It's, it's, the Rambam was coming from a different place. The Rambam's book is all-inclusive. For example, if you look in Shulchan Aruch in the Code of Jewish Law, you won't find the laws of Mashiach. What is Mashiach supposed to look like? When is he going to come? What is he supposed to do? All those things, you will not find them. But in the Rambam, you will find them. Because the Rambam's book is it's, it's, a, it's a complete book. It covers the whole picture of Jewish Law. Maran tells us that any place where he doesn't have an opinion, Maran writes this, exactly. we follow the Rambam. <clears throat> Wherever Maran says, Bechol makom, in any place that he doesn't megale dati, that I'm not revealing my opinion, my opinion is like the Rambam. 
This is a fact. We accepted this on ourselves as a halakha, and that is why we have always... I, I once told somebody recently, you know, we, we follow the halakhot of Maran, but perhaps we strive to the personality of the Rambam. He's our spiritual leader. Maran, you don't hear so much that we tell stories about his life and what he believes in. Maran is our, our, our codifier. He's our legal ruler. But Rambam is who we follow when it comes to Jewish law. And the Rambam says these four things. The first step of Chuma, Azivat Hachet. What does Azivat Hachet mean? Don't, you have to leave the Avera you're doing. Let's say a person is uh, uh, eating not kosher food. So he has to stop eating not kosher food first. You can't do Chuma while you're munching on your cheeseburger. You have to stop eating the cheeseburger and then do Chuma. Step two, you should agree in your heart, decide in your heart, that you will not do this again. This is a huge step. It's different than stopping to do that. Again. What is this? This is a commitment. This is a commitment, Mikan Ulhaba, from now until the future, to not do an Avera again. The third step, Kharata. The Ram says Kharata al Masha'ava. Regret over what was. To feel bad inside of you. I'm sorry that I did what I did. Yeah. How could you regret at the end? It seems like to me like regret would be the first step of the third. The first step would be to regret what you do and then therefore to stop doing it. Kharata is more than just, see, it's again regret. Kharata is not just like. I don't want to keep doing this anymore. I feel bad that I'm doing it. Kharata is a... Um, when a person, let's say, is ashamed of their past. yeah, They weren't ashamed of themselves and then stopped having that past. They stopped having it and then r- later on in their life realized how ashamed they are of what they did in their life. So you're right. If it was just simple regret, that would be at the beginning. The inspiration for doing tshuva, we're not talking about now. Where that comes from. That would be some form of, of regret. Chalata is deeper than that. It's a certain sense of, I feel terrible about my past, that what I did. Which can only come about when you truly stop doing it. You know, a, a person who smokes will never know how bad it is for them when they're smoking until they stop. They might, while they're smoking, say, like, oh, it's not such a good thing for me, it's not so healthy for me. But only when they're actually out of it and they feel all these effects that are happening to their body and what's going on, then that's when they, whoa, this was really, really bad for me. But it takes, it takes leaving it to know it. And the fourth thing, shitvadeh befiv. A person must do what's called vidui. The closest word to that is confession. Hence the joke at the beginning. To confess, but vidui is more than confessing. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you tell your kids, say you're sorry, I'm sorry. What is that? You know? Like, you don't want to say, I'm sorry. It's not what you're saying. Vidu is, I'm in my mouth. I'm verbalizing something that makes me so uncomfortable to say. I stole from someone. I hurt someone's feelings. I broke Shabbat. I ate something not kosher. Why is it so hard to say something? To face what you did. When you verbalize something, you're facing what you do. You'll find in Jewish thought, when you speak, your speech is a very powerful thing. You'll find that when a person learns, when a person learns Torah, they don't actually learn it unless they say it with their mouth. I have this problem. I like to read. And when you read, you don't really learn. A rabbi tells you, you must say the words out loud. That's the way the Ramam says the first step to remembering is to say them out loud. Now, it's annoying to say them out loud. But the truth is, oh, very good. There's a reason I feel I was once in a bit connected. Um, in Atlit, I was there praying, and I came to one of the parashiyot, and there was the, the name Kor Omer. right? And one guy said the name is Kar Omer. and one guy said the name is Kor Omer. and they were fighting. Is it a Kamatz Katan or is it a Kamatz You know, in the middle of Torah reading, they're screaming at each other, and. Someone said, oh, let's go look in the book. So they pull out the Ishma Tzliach, they look inside, it says one way. And then one guy stood up and he said, listen, I don't care what it says in the book, but I remember my whole life hearing that in our old synagogue, the man who read the Torah always said, Kor Del Omer. And therefore, that's what it's going to be. When you say things out loud, you really remember them. 
you remember them. Just now, somebody sent me a video of a guy who once used to be Hasidic, probably. He's standing in the middle of the forest, and he's leading the Yom Kippur tefillah as if he was still a Hasid, you know, with the accent and everything. And, and there are certain things that once you say them out loud, you don't forget them. In Hebrew, we call it Gilsad Yankuta. You're the things you learned when you were still nursing. You, you, things from your childhood. You said them out loud. You remember them. They become part of your base instinct. To say things over and over and over again, it's kind of, uh, you know, like on, on Rosh Hashanah. Remember we said the Tehillim seven times? We kept saying, Lam we kept saying. It, it's, it gets into your head. You build something. In certain traditions, people, they chant certain things over and over and over again. <laughs> There's something to be said for repeating things verbally. And it's about this part of Chuba that I want to talk about today. So there are four about steps. Vidui. The four steps are leaving the Chet, deciding to never do it again, regretting, being ashamed of the past, and then Vidui, saying verbally that I did something wrong. And this is the part that I wanted to analyze today. I tell a story, I've told it to you many times in my classes. But my wife always shared this, and it's an important story to remember. Now that it's during the week, you can write it down. The Slono Marebbe, I love Shalom. The Slono Marebbe, his name was Rabbi, I want to say Noach, but I could be wrong about his first name. His last name was Berezovsky. He was the famous, the Slono Marebbe. He wrote a book called Netivot Shalom. Five books on the Chumash, two books on Musav, and many other small books on different things like the Holocaust and, and, and uh, raising children, and marriage, and all kinds. My wife, this is one of her areas of expertise in his writings. Then the Tivot Shalom, he tells a story about a farmer who once came out of his house with brand new boots. And he steps in the mud. And he got very angry that he, got st- that he stepped in the mud. So he picked up his right foot and he starts to clean off the boots. Oh, it's clean. He puts it down and he picks up his left boot to clean it. He cleans his left boot, he pulls down, both of his boots are dirty. He gets all angry. So he picks up his right foot again, he starts cleaning his boots. And he does this for about 30 minutes. So his wife opens up the door. And his wife says, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to clean my boots, but they keep getting dirty. He said, no, you have to step on the sidewalk if you want to clean your boots. You can't be in the mud trying to clean your boots. It doesn't work that way. And that's why King David tells us, Sur mera tov. You must first leave evil, and then you can begin to do good. You cannot do good while you're still in the trenches of things that are bad. You, you don't have the ability to do it. It's, you, yeah, you can clean off your shoes for a few minutes. But then you relapse back into this, this world of darkness and world of confusion, and it's not good. So the Rambam is going to zoom in on us today about Vidui. And Rav Perez is going to walk us through this idea, and I want to walk you through it as well. I'm reading to you now from the Rambam. We needed to, we needed to cut ourselves, like, if we feel that the situation is not right, or the situation brings us darkness. It's like you... We, we learn in Bosch Hashanah when we created that. Yeah. But we need to like, cut there are, Yeah, there are certain right. things that need to be cut off. And it takes a person wisdom to know what to be cut off and what to be rehabilitated. Certain things you can change them. Other things you cannot change them. And you have to be able to tell the difference between the two of them. If you, if you go back to the cigarette, for example, then everybody knows that when you smoke, if you go back to one, you go back to you go back to smoking. When you quit smoking, you can't go back. You're not even to one. Right. Same thing with alcoholics. Same thing with it's drug addicts. You know, uh, it becomes right. it becomes a problem. But there are certain things that don't always need to be cut off. I want to give an example. And for example, when it comes to other people. There are certain people that must be cut out. You have to know, pure evil must be cut out. It's, it's a fact. There, is, there are certain things you cannot, we spoke about this on Shabbat, you cannot negotiate with. But most often are not people that are in our people, they're in our family. We shouldn't be so quick to cut them out because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know, you don't know who one day is going to see the light, who one day is going to turn around, and it's worth keeping even this investment on in a low flame, on a back burner. To keep a connection with somebody knowing that maybe one day they'll need help. There was a doctor in Israel who once was, uh, he was working a shift in the emergency room. There's a man who came in and the doctors decided that he needed to have his legs amputated. Which you never know. It's a terrible thing. The life is saved, but really the life is, is a terrible way to live on. And all the doctors agreed unanimously there's no hope. 
And there was one doctor who came in and said, let me try. There's a 10% chance. And nothing worse can happen if we try than if we don't. Let me try at the 10% chance. The other doctors didn't want to help him. And they said, you know what, it's on your head. If it doesn't work out, it's your problem. And the doctor went through and he was successful in the surgery. And when this man woke up and he had, Bo Hashem, two healthy legs, he asked to meet the doctor. And he asked the doctor, the doctor, I don't understand. Everyone else said 90% chances of failure. Why did you go out on a limb, literally, uh, no pun intended, why did you go out on a limb to try to save the other... T- why did you take this chance with me? You don't even know me. And the man told him, you know, I had a grandfather. It was the chief rabbi of Israel. His name was Rabbi Cook. And when I went to medical school, my grandfather taught me, the human body is like the Jewish people. He said, if you see a body part that's very, very sick, he said, think a hundred times before you cut it off. He said, if there's a way to save it, even if it's a very small chance, try to save it before you cut it off. And I promised him that in my medical career, he would do the same thing. And that's what this doctor did. And look, he saved some of his life because of that. Not everything we cut, but you have to know. It takes that, and that's where you ask Hashem for guidance, because over there, there's no one who has the real answer. That's what the Rambam tells us. The Rambam says, Kol mitzvot sheba Torah. All of the commandments in the Torah. Ben aseh, whether the active commandments, ben lo taseh, or the passive commandments. Meaning, don't do so and so. Im avar adam alachat mehen, if a person violates one of those mitzvot, ben bezadon ben shgaga, whether he did it intentionally or unintentionally. Kshi aseh tshuva, when a person does tshuva, when he returns via shuv mecheton, he leaves this Avera that he was doing, he leaves his wrongdoing. Chayav lihitvadot lifnei ha'el baruchu. He has to speak to Hashem and verbalize what he did wrong. Confess. I'm going to use that word. He has to confess out loud what he did wrong. So you have to do four before you, or at the same time that you do one. Right. So this isn't, isn't this in, in order. This is just a four elements. Okay. Well, some would say that it's different orders. There are different opinions in this. Shnema, like it says in the Torah, Ish o Isha, a man or a woman, ki asu v'gom if they do anything wrong, v'hit v'duet chatata masher asu, they must confess their what they the wrongdoing which they did. Ze v'duet dvarim, v'duet ze mitzvat ase. Says the Rambam, this v'duet this confession is a biblical commandment that even though you already did tshuva, you've decided not to do it, you've stopped doing it, you've stayed away from doing it, you still have to. Confess. You still have to verbalize what it is that you did wrong. Ketzad mitvadin. Says the Rambam. How? What's the formula that I say? Omer, you say Anna Hashem. Please God. Chatati, aviti, pashati. I sinned. I did wrong. I did bad. Lefanecha in front of you. Vasiti kach v'kach. And I did so and so. And I've regretted my actions and I'm embarrassed about them. And I no longer will go back to doing this again. This is the main part of Vidui. It's verbalizing, I did this wrong and I will not do it again. So what about in the days where there were sacrifices? I once went to visit my father at work. And there was a Christian man who was working there. And it was about this time of year. And I don't know if you know, but the Christians are obsessed with the fact that we don't have a Ben Mikdash, that we don't have a temple. And their whole philosophy is that when we had a temple, we did something wrong and we would go kill a goat and it was okay. Kind of like the story with the Hail Marys. But now that we don't have a temple anymore, we don't have a way to become forgiven, except for uh, through their their friend, the, the funny man. And we don't believe in that. We believe that even if you bring a sacrifice, the sacrifice itself, how many times do the prophets tell us, I don't need your sacrifices? What do I need your... I, I, Hashem, he doesn't have enough cows up there. Hashem doesn't have enough goats. He needs your goat. The one that you got on sale for one special... What is it? Well, you, Hashem needs your goats. It says the Rambam, V'chen balei chatot v'ashamot, even when a person brought a sacrifice, en mitkaper lehen, they're not atoned for, they're not forgiven, bekorbanam, with their sacrifice, until they do tshuva, until they return, and they say vidui. You can bring all the goats you want. 
But until you say this, it doesn't work. And all the people that bedin, the court puts to death, or the court has to give lashes to, it doesn't help. Until, even if a person is killed by a court, if he doesn't in his mouth say, I did something wrong, that's not enough to get him forgiveness. And even if you steal from a person, or you hurt a person, even if you pay them back, he's not forgiven until he makes a verbal statement, I did something wrong and I will not do it again. So if a person steals $100 and he gives his friend back $100, it's not over. Not until he says, I stole $100 and I will not do this again. Rabbi Peretz, from Rabbi Peretz. Yes. And then the Sefer Chinuch, the book of mitzvot. Some of you have this book at home. The 613 mitzvot. And it says in there that if a person does tshuva, but he doesn't do vidui, it doesn't help. And the other way around, if a person does vidui, he confesses what he did wrong, but he doesn't do tshuva. It says Sefer Chinuch, Hatovel, Vesheretz biyado. It's like a person who goes to immerse themselves in a ritual bath, the mikveh, they go to the mikveh, and they're still holding on to something impure. Does it help? No, because you're still holding on to that which is impure. So no matter how many times you're going to go into the mikveh, so long as you're still holding on to this, it doesn't help. So when a person comes to the Bit Knesset, this is where I'm going, and we're going to stand here in Yom Kippur, and we're going to go like this all day long, it doesn't help. It doesn't help to beat your chest unless you actually mean what you're saying. It doesn't even help to do tshuva unless you say what you did wrong. And it doesn't help to say what you did wrong unless you're willing to do tshuva. It's all a package deal. But you should know vidui in and of itself is a mitzvah. It's not part of the mitzvah of tshuva. There's one commandment to do tshuva, to return, and there's another commandment to do vidui, separate. It's called emet liyakov, the truth to Yaakov. So now I want to complicate. Can I complicate your life a little bit? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Before I complicate, let's tell you a story. The Talmud tells us that that even thinking about doing tshuva is considered a tshuva. It's a very basic level of tshuva. It's a very um, juvenile level of tshuva. You think about it. I think that I want to stop eating that kosher food. That works. Say a person passes away in that moment, God forbid, it's considered that they did vidu, they did tshuva over what they did wrong. There's a famous story about Rabbi Kook. Rabbi Kook lived at a time that the state of Israel was being dreamt about and being planned. There was no state of Israel yet. But all these Jews were coming to Israel, they were coming back, poets, singers, authors, uh, socialists, uh, kibbutzniks, all kind of pioneers. Whoever came there, came there. And there was an interesting phenomenon that many people who had been in rabbinic school had left their rabbinic studies at Yeshiva and had become secular poets and authors and, and all kinds of people, like Chaim Nachman Bialik. Chaim Nachman Bialik learned in Yeshiva, in Volozhin, yeah, with Rav Kook. Acharam, you have a lot of people who were, who were there. Interestingly enough, I just read a letter from Rabbi Uziel critiquing a piece of Achad Ha'am and Shuva, correcting him. And it's interesting to think that they were learning each other's book. It was a different generation, it was a different place. And there was one man, his name was Eliezer ben Yehuda. Eliezer ben Yehuda, what can you tell me about him? Right, they call him the reviver of the Hebrew language. He made the first. What? He made the first. Dictionary. dictionary, the first Hebrew dictionary defining words. Listen, you're coming back after 2,000 years not speaking a language. Someone has to put it together for you. Mm-hmm. And you have these incredible pictures of, of Eliezer when he was studying with, with uh, the Chumash open, and the Torah is open, and the Tanakh open, and the Talmud open, and the Zohar, all kinds of books open without a keep on his head. He knew all these sources, but he was not at all observant of Torah Mitzvah. And once he came to Rav Kook's office, and he would come to Rav Kook a lot, because the famous saying that at the time was that there's nobody, there's only one man who knows every word in the Hebrew language, and that's Rav Kook. 
but there's nobody who doesn't, there's nobody who can say that they for sure know that one word is not in Hebrew. But only the one who knows the most Hebrew is Rav Kook. So they would very often go to Rav Kook to consult him on things. And they came to Rav Kook, and Rav Kook helped them out with one of his questions. And Rav Kook says, Eliezer, when are you going to just do tshuva already? When are you going to give up your act of being secular and then start keeping to Amis all again? And Eliezer ben Huda said, You know, Rav Kook, it's about time that I do that. And he left and he passed away that week. And Rav Kook went to his funeral. And Rav Kook said that he thought about doing tshuva, and that means that he left this world a righteous person. He left this world thinking about doing tshuva. And they might say, that's not fair. Here, I have to work so hard, I have to fast, I have to do vidui, I have to change my life around. This guy, all he has to do is sit in someone's office, and, oh, I think I'll do tshuva. So that's what I'm going to do also. Obviously, it's a very basic level of tshuva, but it works. It's a famous story. I think, I think, I think, I don't remember if it was Rabbi Khanim ben Tahadion when they were killing him, the Romans were killing him. And uh, it's crazy stories that they were doing. They were burning him alive, and, and the Romans had put sponges on his heart. Or maybe it's Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva? Rabbi Khanim Rabbi Khanim Rabbi They put sponges on his heart to make him live as long as he could so he could suffer the most while he was burning. And he turned to this bur- the executor, and he said, by the way, the cruelty the human beings can have towards each other, it's a, it's a testament to how holy we can be, but also to how low and depraved we can be. It, it's, everything in the world is an opposite. So if you turn on the news and you see what people are doing in the world, and you have to know the human beings are capable of the exact opposite. You can go to YouTube and put in videos about Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, or about Chacham Ovedi Yosef, or about the Lubavitch Rebbe, or Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. Then you can look up, or Mordechai Eliyahu, and you can see this is the exact opposite of those people. They were the epitome of refinement, of goodness, of kindness. The man was speaking to Rabbi Chanei Mataradeon. Rabbi Chanei was burning and he said, Maybe you'll just take the sponges off my heart and let me die quicker. And he did. But he said, What am I going to get in return? He said, You, if you do tshuva, you'll go to Gan Eden. If you do tshuva, I'll let you into the Garden of Eden. So he did it. He took the, heart, the, the sponges off. Rabbi Chanei died. And then he jumped into the fire also. And a voice came out from heaven. And said, Yesh kone olamo b'sha'achat. There is a person who could get into the next world in one moment. And they even called him Rabbi so and so, if I'm not mistaken. He was a Roman, he wasn't even one of us. But I mean, there, was, there is a point in life where you can make that leap. But it's a very small leap, but it's still a leap. So, knowing all of this, let's ask you a question. We know that you have to verbalize Vidui. And if you don't verbalize it, what happens? It doesn't count, right? Yeah. But here, thinking about tshuva works. So what are we saying? How does that work? Either you have to verbalize it, or you can just think about it. Don't tell me I, uh, it's both. <clears throat> so I want to read you a Gemara. The Gemara tells us, and this is the Rambam Kod advises also. A guy comes to a lady and says, I want to marry you. And he's an evil person. Are they married? They have two witnesses and a rabbi and everything. Are they married? Why not? Of course they're married. How many evil people get married every day? <laughs> oh, enough. Yeah. Yeah, obviously she agrees. Okay, yeah, Rachel, she's right. She agrees. But what if, what if this happens? What if he says to her, I will get married to you on condition that I am a tzaddik, that I'm righteous. But he's really an evil guy. Is she married or is she not married? She is? She's not. Why? Is she righteous? Is he righteous? No. no. Or maybe he did tshuva. <clears throat> he didn't say anything, right? Listen to what the Rambam says. If a man tells a lady, "I will marry you," al menat shani tzadik, and condition that I am righteous, even if he's an evil man, she's married to him. Out of a doubt, then that what? Shema hirher tshuva b'libom. Maybe he thought of doing tshuva in that moment. He loved her so much. So you know what? For her, I'll keep tshuva. This goes against what we learned. In the laws of vidu, you have to verbalize it, right? This guy thinks about it, he's already a tzaddik. Guys, tshuva is the easy. 
It's not, you don't even need a three for one special. Here, you just have to think about it. So, what do you think? It's not, you know, I mean, unless you actually say that you actually do something, he's not doing anything. He, he's, he's starting the first step on the path. But, but, I mean, if you're still alive, you have to do more than just say, I'm thinking about it. Also, in Judaism, we have Mishel Olishma, Balishma. Right, but, but we're talking about Shuvah. We need to do it. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you knew a person who didn't keep kosher. Imagine. How would you now assume, what would they have to do in order for you to think they do keep kosher? So if they just tell you it's enough? Then you would just solve that by God. For a person to go from the category of not keeping kosher to yes, keeping kosher, what would they have to do for you? For you, not for Hashem, for Hashem, for you. For you to trust that's that they're keeping kosher. This I come to my house and cash it, and I buy the food in this and this store. Is that what you would do? I think. Okay. Okay, so then she would need to know how they make the food. What else? <coughs> it take, building confidence, building trust is a wrong process. It's so <coughs> yeah. So... Would any of you say that the person has to come into the synagogue and announce to the whole world, I used to keep not kosher, but now I'm keeping kosher? No. no. That, that would not Why embarrassing? Wait a second. No, we're not talking about embarrassment. So you don't believe in vidui. <laughs> See, you don't understand the importance of vidui. No, but you, you don't make it a requirement for a person to publicly announce. Yeah. You said you have to say it out loud, but in front of Hashem, you didn't have to say it out loud. Oh, very good. Okay, you're, you're picking on a good point. But that's not. Would you have said? None of you said that he has to tell Hashem that he's keeping kosher. Of course, the way he's doing it. No, but he has to tell Hashem that he. Is so it, now, but none of you said that. So none of you told me that he has to have a conversation with Hashem, and when she said, "Hashem, I, 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 I used to keep not kosher. kosher." Why did none of you tell me that? It's obvious. No. No, because for you, you don't think it's necessary. That's a white time. Just like if somebody would steal a hundred dollars from you. And they gave you back a hundred dollars from you. Would you also demand them to stand in front of you and say, I stole a hundred dollars from you, I will not do it again? No. No, you're happy to get your hundred dollars back, right? Just give it back to me and get out of my life. That's because you're not Hashem. You don't appreciate, myself included, the value of words. <clears throat> Says the Rambam, when it's a marriage, a marriage, a man saying, I will marry you on condition that I'm a righteous man. What makes this man righteous for the lady he's married? Does he have to go through the four steps of tshuva in order to become righteous? No, as long as she believes him. No, as long as she believes him, right? As long as she believes that he's going to be righteous, then that's good enough. You have many halakhot like this. Do you remember we learned together in the laws of of, um, lying to people? You said something that was misleading, but you didn't actually lie, Right? You didn't actually lie. You go to a hotel and you use their gym because you know the codes of the door because once you stayed there. And you, use the, you come back every day to go to the gym. And so one day, one of the people working there, they say, oh, how long are you staying here for? Now you don't answer their question. You don't tell them, I'm staying in this hotel because you're not staying in the hotel, right? What do you tell them? You tell them, I'm here for a long time because you live in San Diego. <laughs> Did you lie? No, where is here, right? Here is a vague question. You answered back with a vague answer. Say, our rabbis, you are a liar. Because it doesn't go based on what you said. It goes based on what the person understands. So says the Rav Peretz, the Rambam is right in this halakha, because when he's marrying the other person, it's not if Hashem thinks he's righteous. He's not saying, if Hashem considers me righteous, then I'm married. If I'm righteous, maybe if you consider me righteous, and for you, all it takes is for me to, to believe that I'm righteous. But when it comes back to Hashem, Vidui has to be real. Marlene, you don't like it. Don't know why you don't like it. So the next day, they're married one day, and he's already a Rasha again. <laughs> why would she believe him, and why would that make it valid? He's actually, if he's really going to do Chuba, okay, but if he's just saying it just to get married, and then... He, he doesn't change anything. He, he, he's lied to his misled. But in that moment, he changed something. How many people on Yom Kippur come and say, Hashem, I will not do this, I will not do that, and they do it again the next morning? 
Does that mean they didn't do tshuva? Okay, so you're, you're saying tshuva was okay for, for two minutes? Two, okay? the, two minutes of tshuva. He promised. It's like when we, we know the ball. That means one day we promise. Like we promise. But you still annul the vows again next year. Mm-hmm. Why do you, if, if you promised last year and then you're not going to do this again, mm-hmm. why are you doing it again this year? By definition, exactly, but it's not really because you have Oh, very good. Changing. So you are thinking like Hashem now, you see? You're thinking oh, like Hashem now. Oh, Hashem <laughs> needs a person to say and actually mean what they say. And this is the point that I wanted to get to tonight, and with this I'm going to leave you thinking. If a person takes a sidu, a sidu, and they pray, and they go, whatever, and they don't understand the word they're saying, but they know how to read it. Or even they read the English, but they don't understand the word they're saying. But they're saying it. Do they get a mitzvah for doing that? Probably some level mitzvah. It's, it's what's that kabbalah. Like like That's some credit. It. I mean, would it be better to read it and understand what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. But what if a person reads it and doesn't understand what they Do they get something? Still, yeah, because but let's say they're reading Shema, right? Shema is from the Torah. So just reading Torah is a mitzvah in and of itself. Saying holy words that were written by holy people is also mitzvah of itself. Yeah. Yeah. What if a person comes on Yom Kippur and they pull out the vidui and they say, yes, I'm going to go down blah, 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 because they do that all, every day after tefillah. Do they also get some kind of mitzvah? Yeah. Okay. Mm. At that moment, yes. Yeah. Because it does the vidui. Who, sa- who said, mm, it's, I don't it's so yeah. Why not? Because it's not promising anything. Okay, yeah. See, vidui... Our confession that we do every day after tefillah, it's not a prayer. Just like Hatarat and Darim, the annulment of the vows. Why do I make sure that I'm the one who reads it? Because I know how the other guys read it. They read it like it's a song. It's not a prayer, guys. You're either saying, I want to get rid of all my vows, I have to regret everything I say. This is not a, like a, it's not a song you're singing. This is a statement that you're making. Vidu is a statement. It's not a prayer. It's not a part of Torah that you're reading. It's a vid- I stole and I will not steal again. I hurt somebody and I will not hurt them again. I'm embarrassed and I don't want to be embarrassed anymore. If a person doesn't have any intention when they mean that, when they say that, it doesn't count for anything. <clears throat> and I want to read to you just from Rav Chaim of Volozhin. Rav Chaim of Volozhin was a Kabbalist who lived in Europe <clears throat> in Volozhin. He was from Vilna. Later on in his life, he was a student of the Vilna Gaon. He writes the following thing. Omnam kashihit palel bekol vichitu chotiot hadibur levad. If a person prays from the sidu, just with his mouth and reading the words, even though they have no intention, they're not thinking the right things when they're just reading. Hagam shebevaday enab madrega shlema vegvoha karoi. Even though it's not the highest level of prayer that it should be, v'nei cholal alot leolam amachshava. And it cannot reach that world, world in Kabbalah, of the world of thought, the world of the souls. Because it was not said with any thought or any intention. It's not for nothing. This tefillah doesn't disappear into nothingness. If you fulfill your obligation of praying. But says Rav Peretz, This is, vidui is not the same thing. Vidu is not any kind of prayer or praise of Hashem in and of itself. There's nothing in it that's uh, words of Torah. The whole purpose of saying Vidu is in order to do Tshuva. When it's not true, you're not doing Tshuva. It's not true, you're not doing Tshuva. Says our parents, if somebody truly understands this, they would go around and tell the whole world. Comes Vidui. I know it says 30 things in your book to say, right? All kinds of things you need to say. When's the last time you stole from somebody? It depends. Oh, don't answer me if you did, by the way. <laughs> no, it well, depends. It's every day. I hope. A little thing. A little I know that I didn't steal from anybody in the last year. I can tell you for sure. If anything, I was stolen from, but I didn't steal from anybody. Now maybe there's some one time that I uh, a penny that happened in the grocery store was a mistake. Okay, so once on Yom Kippur I'm going to say Gazamu. But the rest of Yom Kippur I'm not going to say Gazamu. I don't have time to waste on stealing. I didn't steal this year. 
I, I did Tzion uh, Avaim. I made my parents' life difficult. <laughs> that one I'm going to say a few times. But uh, also, excuse me, also give me advice, give me about that, not just money or Okay, things. but I'm, what I'm sharing here an idea. The idea is I... choose three, four, five things that you need to focus on. And then more than that, if there are things in this that are not written down, add your own. Don't rush. Don't. It's not everyone saying Kaddish. Forget about them. You have to do vidui. Think about the things you did wrong. Now nobody else is supposed to hear your vidui. We don't confess in the confession booth. But you have to, in your mind, be able to say, in your mouth, verbalize Hashem. This is what I did wrong this year. I did it wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. And there are many things, many avirot that we did wrong this year that are not on the list. And that's why at least one time in Yom Kippur, we say the long vidui. You'll find it in our Sidu. We'll go through it, God willing, on Sunday when we have our class on the Mahzal. The Vidui, I think we're going to do it on Sunday, I think. The Vidui, the Vidui, the long one of Rabbeinu Nisim is like 20 pages. I don't know, it's a very long one. You remember every year we say, basically anything in the world you could have done wrong is on that list. Although today there are all kinds of new things that people do wrong that are not on that list because even then they could not have thought that people would do the things people do today. Do you have an example? There was a website now that just got in big trouble. You probably heard about it on the news. A website that was made for people who cheat on their spouses. Oh, I heard. Yes. You heard about it? And somebody hacked in and stole everybody's email addresses and, and their phone numbers and, their, and they published their names. Now, it, it's a terrible thing that happened. Ter- terrible in all kinds of ways. I, it, terrible that people found out. Terrible that this is the way they found out. Terrible that people are doing these things and there's a whole industry. They asked the CEO of this company. You have to understand, the human logic is so twisted. They asked the CEO of the company, do you feel like you're helping people do something wrong? You know what the CEO of the company said? He said, absolutely not. I'm helping keep marriages safe. If it wasn't for me, if it wasn't for me, then the spouse would find out. My whole job is to make sure the spouse doesn't find out, and therefore their marriage stays together. Can you understand the craziness of such a person? And so what, what happens here? Anything justified? What happens? Anyone? What happens is, uh, a guy says, I'm going to go to Las Vegas. Why? He tells the wife, I'm going to a business meeting. In this company, they'll make flyers for the business meeting. It's fake. Everything's fake. Oh. They'll make business cards that he got from his friends. Yeah, they'll have a phone number that the person calls, the wife calls. Oh, yes, he's in a meeting. We'll call you back. The whole time, it's one big lie. This Avera, I don't think Rabbeinu Nesim could have thought of to put inside of the book. I don't think he would have known that this is something that happens. In reference to this website, there was a pastor who belonged to it, and when the name kept up or released or whatever, he committed suicide. Really? Yeah. I, heard, I, I don't remember the name. So the, no, uh, suicide over, over this exposure. Well, well, right, no, the, the exposure I don't believe is a good thing. I don't believe it was... I don't believe it. I, I just in general. My yeah, status is I don't believe. And, but these things are... There are certain things we still have to add in. You know? Teenagers have their own things they have to add in. People of different ages have their own things they have to add in. Everyone has things they need to say. But the main point in Vidui is say it with kavana, Say it with the proper intention. In Baltimore, the custom of the Ashkenazim is to say Vidui three times during Slichot. And in Baltimore, they didn't let us say it three times. Only once. Once, but the same amount of time it takes to say it three times. And that was something to teach you. To teach you it's not a prayer. It's something you really have to mean. And I'm asking you on Yom Kippur. Don't come at Yom Kippur without a list. Make a list in your head. It doesn't have to be on paper. Nobody needs to know about it. But make a list of things that I must do vidui about. Because even the Yom Kippur, even that holiest of holy, even that Ni'ilah, you're going to stand here and we're going to be feeling like angels, that doesn't do the job on its own. The person must be able to say, Hashem, Hashem, I am sorry. I did this and I will not do it again. And why is that so important? Why? And this is the moment I've been waiting for. Because the whole point of Yom Kippur is saying, Hashem, my relationship with you is problematic. I haven't been faithful. I haven't been good. I haven't been honest with you. In the very least, Hashem says, I'm big enough to hear you honestly. I want that when you do an Avera, come and tell me that you did it. Don't be like Adam and Chava in the Garden of Eden. They pretend that, oh, Hashem, we're hiding. What, what, who are you hiding from? That's why we read the Haftarah of Yonah. Yonah thinks he's hiding from Hashem. We, we laugh at these stories. Oh, who does Yonah think he could hide from? From God he's going to hide? But we do this every day. The fact that we're embarrassed to tell Hashem what we do wrong is because we believe that if we don't say it, we're going to get away with it. 
And at the very least, we have to be aware, we are no different than them, and we are going to say it. You know, because Hashem, He doesn't punish you when you say it. In fact, when you say, I did something wrong, that's one of the steps of tshuva. That's one of the openings of the doors to say, I accept that I'm doing something wrong. I want to change it. Hashem, help me do it. But Yom Kippur is about establishing a relationship with Hashem. It's not about anything else. It's not about the fasting. It's not about the praying. It's not about the shofar blowing. All of those are there to enhance you being able to focus on nothing else. I'm not focusing on meals. I'm not focusing on cutting up salads. I'm not focusing on setting the table. I'm not focusing on my clothes. I'm not focusing on my perfume. I'm focusing just on one thing, being having an honest, an open, and a genuine relationship with Hashem. And you might stand there and keep going and say, Hashem, I don't actually know what to tell you. I don't know what to say. But I know that I want to say something, and I need your help. That is the best we do a person can do. And that we do it will take us a very long way. And while you're doing vidu, I ask you not to forget what Rav Kook said. Rav Kook said, you also have to do vidu. You also have to confess the things that you do right. You do things that are right. You say things, Hashem, this year I was a good person. Say those things also. Hashem, nice this year I gave charity. I was a good person. Don't spend all of Yom Kippur knocking yourself down. Spend a little bit of Yom Kippur lifting yourself up as well. Bazaar Hashem, we shall all have a, a easy and meaningful fast that should be successful for us. And Hashem should turn that red string, that string that has all of our avirot, all of our wrongdoings, to a white string. Bazaar Hashem, if your sins are going to be like blood, Hashem says, Kasheli Gelbin, I'm going to turn them white like snow. Bazaar Hashem, the world should be white like snow. We should come, young people, if you can, in a modest way, dress like white if it's uh, not white you don't have modest white clothing it's better to wear modest clothing that's not white uh, but a person should have in mind I want to be close to Hashem that's all I'm asking for everyone should have a Shana Tavam Tukan